You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. The inmates were torturing me. This biker gang was told that I was an informant. So for a week, they thought it was real. They were trying to kill me. So I hung myself and a guard caught me and he cut me down and said that I wasn't allowed to cheat the state of Pennsylvania out of my punishment. Even if I didn't get executed in the electric chair, they were going to have a life sentence plus 60 years to make sure that I would never get out. Here's the crazy thing. I had some amazing, brilliant friends on death row. I still consider Craig Murphy the closest dude I ever had a friendship with. And he had killed 10 people. I looked and he had like something in his head. So I looked again and he had a screwdriver sticking out of his head. So I walked in the cell. I was like, dude, hold on. I'm going to go get the guard. All right. And he looked at me, said, am I going to die? And I said, no, man, I promise you, I'm going to go get the officer. And then when I turned around the ground, he slumped over. So I fucking lied to that kid, told him he was going to be okay. I grieved for my little brother dying in my parents' basement. And I wondered if I could actually handle freedom. And boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got a very interesting character, Nick Yaris. Nick, how about you? James, Derek, thank you. This means so much. We've been in touch since I landed, and I knew it would come about. Yeah, like, mad story. Like, you've had a kind of tortured life, no disrespect in any way, but you put on Joe Rogan, told your story, the biggest platform on the planet. Um, a man who was death row nearly 25 years, wrongly convicted, now you're out telling a the tale. They've made documentaries about it. Yeah, they've wrote books about you. You've actually wrote the books, but we'll plug the books straight away because they're very interesting. Okay, so this book was written called The Kindness Approach yep. right after we had the SIDS death in our lives. So I tried to use everything that I could to help people with the biggest sorrows. And you know what it's like to come back from just the depths of just despair and hurt and pain, right? So I had a real honor and blessing that Robin Sharma wrote the foreword for the book and I started out. And the other cool thing is, that's actually what I was telling you, that's Ilchester, England, where we used to live, which was a prison town. The Romans at one point had all of the inhabitants in prison. And then I got back to England and I'm living in a former prison. So it was really beautiful and then, while I was with Laura, I wrote this latest book, which is Monsters and Madmen. Now, this story was too big to tell when I wrote Seven Days to Live because it would have messed up how I developed and educated myself because they put me in a three-year experiment. I was next to the guy that was the real Buffalo Bill. I was tortured by a guard who just wanted to drive me into the ground. You know what I mean? So I kept all of that aside, and these are the last two books that I wrote. And then here I am, I just came back to England and it's so strange. We weren't even supposed to meet and everything starts unfolding, right? So for those of you who are um, frequent uh, viewers of James's podcast, my name's Nick Yaris and I'm a former death row prisoner uh, who spent 23 years in solitary confinement waiting to be executed. In 1985, I escaped from death row and I was on the FBI's most wanted list for 25 days. I turned myself back in and went back to prison in Pennsylvania. And I became the very first man in America to seek DNA testing to prove my innocence in 1988. There was no exonerations back then. And it was really difficult because there weren't even really innocence projects or these groups now that help people, right? There was only a few. I had to do all of my own legal work most of the time. I got saddled with lawyers who didn't make it easy for me. So it took me 15 years for that DNA to come through and set me free in 2004. An enormous journey I went through and all of that, right? And then when I got out, 
I realized this had to be bigger than me. So I was sitting in my parents' basement in 2004, and I decided I was going to use my education given to myself in prison to come to England, to Sweden, Italy, and to France, all of the big trade partners of Pennsylvania, and ask them to ask Pennsylvania to get rid of their death penalty. I came here and I went on this morning with Philip Schofield and I talked about being the first ever death row exoneree to go and address parliament because I had a, a great honor of addressing a combined session of the lower house. I never believed I would that moment come back and live here. And when I did, like I, I was telling you, one of the greatest joys I had was like, there's so many unique things. I went up to the Fringe Festival and performed for a week one time, rode a motorbike from Watford, England, all the way up to Edinburgh. And it was like the biggest amazing journey to go that far along an island and change countries. I remember there was a sign, the last English petrol station. And I had to stay uh, like a couple hours early in the morning because it was shut. And there was another motorcyclist waiting to get petrol with me. And we started talking about the journey, you know? Mm -hmm. Now you're out, brother. Man. Try to live it. Try to relive this time. But before we get into everything, Nick, I always like to go back to the start with my guests, get an understanding of them, the stuff they've been through. And just, I don't know, it's just, you've got a very interesting story. I think we're going to go deep into it today. But I always like to go back to the start where you sure. grew up, how it all began. Sure. So... I was raised in Philadelphia and um, I went through the era that was all of the civil rights and upheaval. In 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. got assassinated. I mean, there was so much going on where the cities were on fire and all that. And that was the same year I got attacked as a seven-year-old boy and had my head beat in by a man that sexually assaulted me. So my life went chaotically wrong, you know what I mean? I had um, to develop need for eyeglasses. I became that kid in class that wouldn't settle, that just tear away, you know what I mean? And then by the age of 10, I started drinking. So my entire childhood from the age of 10 until I was 17, 18 was just drugs. Just drinking drugs every day, man. What about parents? My mom and dad worked, and I had five siblings. And in a big city like Philadelphia, I was just another kid. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I kept everything to myself. I internalized with it. I did all the mistakes you can do, man. When a kid has something like that happen to him, and he doesn't get a chance to tell someone, and he becomes married to the lie that it didn't happen... It destroys you. It really hurts you inside because you feel dirty no matter what. See, I've had a lot of survivors on people who's been abused back in the day. And it, you know yourself, anyone with trauma or pain, it, you've got two options. You either become a, a villain or a hero. It's like every criminal I interview as well, you see the sadness in them because they've either been bullied or abused or they're younger. It's, yeah. You see, kind of see that connection. Did you ever deal with being abused as a kid, did you ever deal with that in prison or after prison or did you deal with it beforehand that fueled you with anger or anything? Yeah, so the, I had a really horrible experience where I was put through the juvenile detention system in Pennsylvania for petty crimes. And I learned how to become a boxer with trainers from the old Joe Frazier gym who worked as counselors in the facility I was housed. I met my attacker when I was 19 years old. I had just gotten out of the juvenile system and I was fully grown. Now this person in my childhood, I was always a bigger than life person, was only in real life five foot nine. And he weighed about 165 pounds. By the time I was 19, I was six foot two and I weighed over 200 pounds. I was much bigger than him. And I had an incident where I was down by a creek side 
and I saw him coming off of some train uh, steps and down the side of a, a trestle, it's called. And as he got near me, he recognized for the first time ever we were alone and it wasn't him scaring me and it was due date on his ass whooping. You know what I mean? As he came closer and closer to me, I got really at ner first nervous and I got really angry thinking, this is my chance, you know? And the crazy thing is he walked up before me and he started capitulating and going, look, Nick, I have a lot of problems. Please understand. I'm really sorry. And he started weeping in front of me. And the monster in my head started breaking down. And in that moment, it made me realize I had become so much like him. Aggressive, nasty, couldn't care about anyone. It is, that moment just, it blew my mind. I didn't even hurt the dude. I, I, I literally recalled in horror so much from what I witnessed. I told him to get away from me. And then... I shortly right after that, I stole a car and I drove all the way to Miami and I ended up destroying a hotel room and I was put in a mental institution. That's how badly it messed me up. Yeah, it's funny because I had a man on called Jeff Thompson. He's one of the highest ranks, karate expert or martial arts experts in the world. He can kill you instantly. He's an eighth dan. So Jeff used to be a bouncer at like a nightclub. Do you know what a bouncer is here in UK? Yeah, like to stand at the doors yeah. and... Um, he ended up training himself to kill. He was abused by his, his his teacher when he was like twelve or thirteen. Jeff called it the parasite. The parasite was in him. Instead of speaking about it, it's as hard. You're young. You're confused. You don't really know. Then as a kid, he says the parasite get bigger and bigger, which filled him with rage. He then nearly killed a man working on the doors. Yeah. And what happened is. He just trained himself. He wanted to quiet the mind. So he mixed martial arts, like eighth dan, one of the highest ranked in the world. He met his abuser in a cafe. Jeff's seen him. Now this man can kill anybody. He's unbelievable, unbelievable man. He's wrote so many books. I'll actually put you in contact with this man. That I think it'd be a good connection. Wrote countless books as well. One called The Bouncer. Um, unbelievable. But he's seen his abuser in the restaurant, or the cafe. What happened is Jeff froze. Eighth Dan, froze. He didn't know what to do. He had those feelings that you had, rage, anger, freeze. Like, and he stood up, went towards his abuser, and his abuser done the exact same, panicked. Jeff kind of panicked as well, but he said since that day, the parasite died. Yeah. And that's when it became a better individual. Yeah, but see, I was so young at the time that it happened. I hated myself so much for what I'd become. I went on a drunk bitch. And after I did all these drugs and ran away... I was so enraged, I couldn't take it out on anybody. I physically destroyed a hotel room and snapped out. So it's ironic. You, I didn't learn martial arts to have a sport. I literally had to become an assassin in death row to fight assassins. So everything is instant. Jeff will tell you this. There's no Queensbury's rules. You don't get that chance. You're going to go at it. And it's always that fast, you know? I've been stabbed, I've been slashed. It's just instant. And what I I got from all of this was everything I went through, James set me up to survive. If you think about it, all of my childhood friends are dead. Both my brothers are dead. The only way I survived is that God sent me to death row to save me from my neighborhood. What was the mental institute like? I was put basically the first three months in a cell, protective cell, so I couldn't harm myself. And then I was um, sent back to Pennsylvania at the age of 20. So I went back and for the first time in my childhood, I was actually sober and I was living at my parents' house and I got a job in Philadelphia at like a little gift shop. I had a girl, I was happy. And then it started torment me again, torment me again. And right before Christmas, I got high again. So I had this one brief, good, stable part. And then I started shooting meth again, man. Why do you think it is when life's going great? Like, I relapse so many times in my life after feeling amazing. It's fucking feeling amazing. Better relationship with my kids, parents, 
family members, friends. I wasn't stealing. I wasn't lying. And then something would come over me. I still get those urges to gamble. I take drugs. I drink all the time. I just don't act on it anymore. I've got the power back. Yeah. That's why when I go to meetings and when I went to meetings, like I didn't like the saying as I am a alcoholic or I am a gambler. Like, I didn't like that because I'm not anymore. I'm not in recovery. I am recovered, and that's yeah. the way I'll stay. But so, what, what what do you think that is when we? life is going good then we jeopardize it so your your ego's a nasty bitch that's what it is if you think about it look what, what what's the most precious thing you own your anger because your anger can erase every possession you have every relationship you just talked about your anger you could throw it out the window and what's driving your anger your ego so a lot of times our ego will tell us Come on, man, you can you fucked up before, I but I know you love this shit. You can do this. And you're not even hearing this. The next thing you know, you're scoring and you're trying to get high. I went through that. But the great thing about it, I also learned now, I haven't had a drink of alcohol in 42 years. Oh, done? Yeah, because the last time was so horrific, I didn't need another time to be a drunk. And I, I realized something, too. Every seven years of your life, every molecule about you gets erased. That's why you don't look the same at seven that you did at 14 and 21 and 28, right? Mm -hmm. If you stay sober seven years in a row, that person and those cravings are gone. Yeah? Think about it. That whole person that was a drunk has been erased physiologically and even mentally because every part of your body is brand new seven years on. All right? So when I realized by the time I hit 2011 and I hadn't had a drink seven years since I've been released and then another seven years in 2018 since I've been free, 19 years, I haven't been a drunk because that person's gone, man. I don't have that craving or that need and I, I don't have that internal thing that makes me dislike myself. That's where a lot of it comes from, ain't it? We get to that point where we'll say easily, oh, you're, a, you're an idiot. And that shit then goes deep. Because words really do mean, you know what I mean? Yeah, words are powerful. So the night it all happened then, what age were you? When you ended up getting, the, you, you got, it went to prison for petty stuff though. It, yeah, what so, age were you? What's the running of that night? All right, so I started going... I went to prison for these crimes at the age of 20. Before that, I had petty crimes, you know, in and out. Just theft, car theft and things like that. I went to prison at the age of 20. I got sentenced to die at the age of 21. And then I spent the next 8,057 days in solitary confinement on death row for a woman I never even met and her murder and rape. So... It was really profound how I had to go and develop a friendship with myself to get me out of there. I literally took away all the photographs of beaches and cars and titties, and I put a photograph of myself on the wall, and I asked that person to help me get out. Like, I, I started speaking beautifully to that person because... They were going to put me to death. And the way I spoke when I came from Philadelphia was an embarrassment. I didn't have patience to learn anything in school. But I'm sitting there on death row and I'm thinking, I got to make an effort to speak for myself so that when they put me to death, at least I won't embarrass myself. And that's it. Like, I didn't think I was going to get out. I thought they were going to execute me. So I started to educate myself, simple things. I took the dictionary and every word that I didn't understand. I wrote the spelling down 10 times. I wrote its definition down 10 times. And then I used it in a different sentence 10 different times and committed that word to memory. And so I just built this huge vernacular. And then I practiced all of these um, educational uh, booklets, um, study courses, and I began reading. And my first five books were amazing. The Prophet by Khalil Gibran, um, The Count of Monte Cristo by Edmund uh, Alexander Dumas, a 1933 
a medical encyclopedic that taught me all about medicine and how to care for myself, the dictionary, and the general education development booklet. That was with my five first books. The Count of Monte Cristo's brilliant book, Dante's, Edward Dante's. Yeah, so I am a lot like his character. Think about this. Edmund Dante's. Edmund. Yeah, he goes to prison for something he doesn't do. He meets an old man, Dufail, who's going to lead him to a treasure. But the old man dies in prison. He gets out. He goes and gets the treasure. And he comes back and no one recognizes him because he's been away for so long. Sound like me? But my treasure wasn't gold. The treasure was the education I gave myself so that in 2010, I mean 2004, 10, 10 months after my release, I performed at the Colosseum in Rome before 20,000 people in a beautiful suit. Do you, do you see what I mean? Like, I gave myself this treasure of who I could be, and I went around the world with this wonderful thing called neuroplasticity healing, where I can get people to stop being lost to drugs or hating themselves. Imagine that you go to prison and suffer, but God gives you a real gift at the end of that. Then they make it worth it. Yeah, of course, if you're try to do the greater good from it if you can learn from it you know yourself you'd have seen it by being in so long the amount of people who break in prison even though you probably thought they were the strongest what evidence did they have against you for a conviction so it was an inmate named charles catalino who burglarized the prosecutor's home who was convicted of a jury of these crimes that they used to say that i confessed to him no evidence no witnesses no murder weapon no DNA? No, they didn't have DNA in 1981. Oh, yeah. But this is crazy. The murderer had B positive blood type. They knew that from the ser serology test. This was later saved my life because of those evidence that was later found. I'm B positive. When they said that all of the evidence was thrown away, I went through my trial transcripts and I kept saying to myself, B positive. And then I found a sidebar where the prosecutor and the district attorney, I mean, the, the defense attorney and the judge will go to the side and speak. That's called sidebar. It's on a different transcript than your trial. I read all those sidebar transcripts and I realized they had the evidence and I began my efforts to seek DNA testing to prove my innocence. What are you thinking when you got charged for rape and murder of a woman? I was so humiliated because in the county jail, everybody was going to treat me like I was a psycho nut who went out and stalked a woman. I wasn't getting no breaks. And people were trying to collect the bounty that was on me. I got stabbed in the face with a, a, a sharpened broom. I got beat in the back of the head with a pull stick a couple times. A lot of attacks. Yeah, I got stabbed up in... Uh, Holmesburg prison in Philadelphia and if it wasn't for another prisoner picking up a wooden stool and hitting this guy he would have taken me out were you in protection no just normal wing I was on death row whenever there was movement for me in the county it was open season so you have to sat and duck yeah but then it, it even got worse they made me gladiator against other prisoners on death row what's gladiator Two guards are coming to your cell and tell you to come out. Then they take you and put you in an exercise cage that's 10 feet wide, 20 feet long, and then they bring another inmate out. And then there's four guards standing out there with clubs. If you two don't fight, they're coming in and beating both of you for five minutes. Yeah, the prison system in the 60s, 70s, 80s, like, yeah. even in the UK, you hear some of the stories, but not compared to some of the shit that you I was on through. a death row block with 245 guys, man. Is everybody out at the same time for lunch? Is it separate wings? Every one of us were on three tiers. The block was so long that it was like um, 75 cells long and three tiers high. And men would just jump off the top tier and kill themselves after a while. It was the worst prison. I, I was in Huntington State Prison. You could look it up. 
the only prison in America history condemned by the United Nations for its active practices of torture. The average rate of survival for a prisoner on that block was five years. I did 12. I got there in 83 and I left in 95. Did everybody know everybody's charges? Of course. They're all in the law books. Plus they're in the newspaper. So... Yeah, you're a target straight away then. Yeah, so it was weird. Uh, the worst time was going to the showers six at a time, naked, with 12 guards escorting six. It's always two on one. And once they shut that gate and start running the water, that's your most vulnerable time to get stabbed. Guys will bring weapons in their underwear or in their mouths, have a mouthful of toothpaste and a small weapon, spit the toothpaste in your eyes, and then attack you. See, when you're going through your court, going through your trial, it was only a three day trial. Yeah. And then you got convicted. What's going through your mind then when you get convicted? What was the, con what was the conviction? What did you get? So. I had a three-day trial in June of 1982 in Delaware County, Pennsylvania. Right after they showed the jury these horrifying photographs of the victim, the courthouse got hit by a giant bolt of lightning and knocked the power out. Crazy. They took me upstairs and put me in this big cell. And then after they got all of the emergency lighting going and security back, they brought me back down. And um, the jury went to the Wagon Wheel restaurant and they had dinner while they deliberated because it was the 4th of July holiday weekend and nobody wanted to get stuck there. So they found me guilty over dinner. Then they had the cheek to place their orders for dessert to be held up and left, left in that room where they were deliberating because they were going to read out my verdict and immediately have the death penalty phase. And they were going to come back and decide my death or life. So I just wanted somebody to look me in the eye because everybody was ashamed of what they were doing to me. I was a 21 year old kid and I was the only one that had the courage to look around the room. I couldn't understand it, man. So after they sentenced me to die, the judge got angry at me because I told him to go to hell because he couldn't look me in the eye. And he added 60 more years to my sentence. So even if I didn't get executed in the electric chair, they were going to have a life sentence plus 60 years to make sure that I would never get out. What are you thinking your first night in the cells? Man, I was just so lost in my anger. I was humiliated. James, I didn't understand a lot of the words in the courtroom that put me on death row, man. I, it hurt when you're ignorant and people have power over you. It's humiliating, man. It really hurts you. Well, for somebody who was in the mental institute, suicidal on suicide watch all the time, did you ever think about ending it straight away as soon as you went there? Why, why stay no. alive? Yeah, so I made that mistake early on when the... Before I went to trial, the inmates were torturing me. This biker gang was told that I was an informant. So for a week, they thought it was real. They were trying to kill me. So I hung myself and a guard caught me and he cut me down and said that I wasn't allowed to cheat the state of Pennsylvania out of my punishment. They put me in restraints in a hospital and my mom came to visit me. And I'll never forget how she told me, Nikki, I don't care what they do to you. Don't kill yourself. Come home to me. If you can't come home to me, don't give up. So I, I really didn't like the fact that while she was sitting in a plastic chair next to my hospital room, ignorant asshole prisoners were shouting all kind of disgusting things at her. So I promised her on the spot. I said, no matter what I got to do, I'll come home to you. So I tried. What was the first prison you were in? The first prison I was in was Broadmeadow Prison in Delaware County. And then I got taken to the state penitentiary in Huntington. 
and I wasn't allowed to speak in my cell for the first two years in that prison. Why? Because they used it as a form of torture. If you stabbed a prisoner in another part of the state, if you assaulted staff or you did something like uh, try to escape, they sent you to this place called B Block in Huntington Prison, Pennsylvania, to break you, not to correct you, not to make you do time. That block was designed to break the hardest prisoner in Pennsylvania. How many people were in that prison? At the time I landed there in 82, uh, 83, there was 800 people. And then when I left, there was 2,700. And that was after the riot. What's the longest prison you were in? That one, Huntington. Then I went to Pittsburgh for three years, for which I had to hold back the story about being actually a death row experiment. So in 1995, they had to shut Huntington Prison and let the men into a less restrictive housing unit so they could come out of their cell for up to eight hours a day. Get it? Mm -hmm. The administration said, fuck that, not with the cannibals, not with the serial killers, not with the psychos. So guess who got picked with 47 other men? Yeah? So I get sent to Pittsburgh and they put me five stories up with prison guards who have had the most infractions against them treating us. And they told all the guards, every one of these guys is a violent nut job. Don't trust them. They're crazy. How do you think we got treated, man? So this one asshole inmate stole a photograph from this one guard's work folder of his granddaughter and sold it to a pedo. He told the pedo, no matter what, I'll give you a huge gift if you just do me one favor. If they catch you, tell them Nick gave it to you, not me. This guard found out about, you know, he went looking because the fucking photograph got stolen from his work folder. They searched the whole unit. They found it in the pedos. How else? He told them Nick gave it to me. So this guard starts using different inmates to kill me. I was taking a shower. Remote control presses the button, lets the dude out with a blade, and he comes in the shower. We get wrapped up in the plastic sheet. I have to fight him off before I hyperventilate, and they come in and spray us all with gas. It's crazy. So for three years, he tried to break me. In the end, he crushed my hand in a metal door. You see this? My hand was so blown up, they couldn't put handcuffs on me to go see my lawyers for a visit. I didn't say nothing. I couldn't say anything because if you rat on him, he's going to get you worse. So my lawyers couldn't see me because my hand's too swollen. So they had an investigation to find out what happened to my hand. They took me out of that prison and put me in Greene County Supermax to save me from him. When I went to Greene County Supermax, I found out that I had a fatal um, strain of hepatitis C. And then the men that had it with me started dying around me. And the first guy that really profoundly affected me was a guy named Dale Carter, convicted of rape and murder, just like me. And when he was dying of hepatitis C, the nurses would taunt him about asking him if he wanted an aspirin in a very facetious voice. And I knew that was how I was going to die, James. Impacted bowels. Hepatitis C, it was the worst thing you could think of for a prisoner because you're going to die in agony of not being able to pass your own shit. So I went and signed up for the treatments. I got seven months worth of medications of interferon and ribaviron, and I was so sick that they actually doubled my medication by accident and toxified my system and blinded me in my cell. And I'm like, come on, man, I did 20 years of this madness and now they blinded me. So as soon as my eyesight came back, I sat down and asked to be executed. What happens if you ask them to be executed? That's your right as a dead man, ain't it? So if you're on death row and asked for them to execute you, they've got to do it? Yeah. 
Oh, I thought so. You could go get hundred years, two hundred years, because the sentences in America are mad. So if you went in there one day and says execute me, it's, it's done. If you have a sentence of time, you have no power. But if they sentence you to death and you're tired of the game, you can volunteer and within sixty days get your wish. How many people do that? Well, the first one that did it was my neighbor and a good friend of mine named Keith Settlemeyer. And then the real Buffalo Bill did it, Gary Heidnick, the dude that abducted six black women and put them in a pit under his house and fed them, fed one of them to the others. He's a real silence of the lambs, is that? Uh, yeah, that's the real Buffalo Bill, man. He was my next door neighbor for two and a half years. <laughs> I'm laughing, mate, because it's fucked up. It is it's fucked, fucked up. Fucked when you up, try to mate. talk to this guy and his, <laughs> his fucking eyes are out like this. What was he like, Buffalo Bill? Yeah, so he was really fucked up in the head, man. He really was on this. See, they don't do that in justice in the movie, but he was a, a Charles Manson wannabe creating a master race with black women. So he went around Philadelphia in a 1978 um, Rolls Royce with a Cadillac engine in it that he bought because while he was incarcerated for raping a black woman, he did good on stock market and made all this money, got out with like half a million dollars and then went preying on all these black women in Philly. So he bought a house in Philadelphia, had a Rolls Royce, went around picking up hookers and putting them in a pit and fucking torturing them. And he wanted to create, he was saying all this shit, right? This motherfucker was nuts. Look, when we lost power, he would put on a performance about killing the ladies. Sick. Like, that's why they had him in the movie, like, dress up like a woman and do all, but he wasn't doing that. He was performing this ritual of killing these women for us, man. So, man, a lot of black dudes whipped his fucking ass. You hear me? I'm sorry, but you can't do that in a predominantly black prison system and get away with that, yeah? So every once in a while, somebody would just light him up, and then he'd go hide in the cell some more. I had a girl on just a couple of weeks ago and she got an IPP here, which is, un you, you don't even know when you're getting out. You can serve 99 years for yeah. something silly. But she was in next to a serial killer. She'd killed three of her husbands or three of her boyfriends. The killed black the, widow kind of Killed woman. the dog, yeah. But she was end up friends with her. She liked her. No. Because you, you take it, when you're in there, she didn't see the crime. She just seen I know. some fucking nutcase no. just having conversation. So how, is that how you get through your day? You, just, you have to talk? What else can you right. do? Here's the crazy thing. I had some amazing, brilliant friends on death row. I still consider Craig Murphy the closest dude I ever had a friendship with. And he had killed 10 people. But he was part of the Junior Black Mafia. And look, it was like that. You know what I mean? But Murphy had all this wisdom. And I loved hanging out with him because he was just super bright. And I... I, I I met people, yeah, I know they did some horrific shit, but they lived a pious life too. And when someone's living a pious life, why kick them in the face? If they're respectful and they're sorrowful and they didn't ever want to be that person, maybe they did it while they were out of their mind on drugs or whatever, but the person, the man before me was humbled and he didn't want to ever be aggressive and he was so sorry for what he did. How could I not embrace him, man? Who was the maddest person you came across? Fucking Jay Schrader. Who's that? There's a guy abducted a girl. Well, no, he killed his girlfriend, ground her up in meatballs, and then fed her to her parents. <laughs> Fuck going to his for dinner. <laughs> that motherfucker Fuck was crazy. Hell. I know, and he, I tormented him, and I tormented him, and I tormented him until he tried to have me killed for three years. And then he got stomach cancer. How about that for revenge? And he died of stomach cancer in Huntington State Prison with the nurses laughing at him. So the UK, there's not, there's not really any like, psychopaths here. You get the oddballs here, I think, doctor, who killed loads of people, but there's not that many. I don't no. know the population's <laughs> obviously lower, but America seems to have absolute nutcases. Like, did yeah. you, do you see the difference between the UK and America? Yeah, so... It's a frontier nation. People keep forgetting this. Just like Brazil or Australia, it's a frontier nation. 
There's something that goes on when you're far flung away from law and society, and it does seem to produce a higher number in America, especially, of absolute driven, mentally off sexual predators or power junkies. You know, most sexual crimes are about power, right? So it's strange how these men pick out the weakest person in society, be it a child or a girl or a woman, so that they can dominate them. You know what I mean? But when they go to jail, nobody's giving them any breaks. They're in there paying protection or they're in lockup. You understand? Somebody's milking them for the rest of their sentence. And if they don't pay up or they're unlucky, they get the Jeffrey Dahmer beat down to death. They beat his head flat, man. So, yeah, it's, it, it's really horrifying how many people in America are ultra-violent, man. You see, I can't understand going in and killing nine-year-old children in the school. What the fuck's wrong with you, man? And yet, I remember when I was growing up, you had to be really cool or know somebody to get a hold of a gun. Nobody trusted just anybody with a gun. Now anybody can get a gun. They don't even want to do background checks on mental health issues like that last shooter who clearly had mental health issues. <coughs> I think the shame of it, America loves an identity. America needs to have a boshy aggressive, we're bigger and badder than everyone identity. And part of that's guns. Yeah, it's mad. Like I say, there's a lot of bad shit. Harold Chipman, his name was, he killed so many people. He was a doctor. And, but America just seems to have serial killers. And the thing is, some of these people are adored. Manson was adored. Like, the, the guy that made the Netflix documentary about yeah. you there, Dalma, adored people, loved them. Yeah. Like, it's, the brought people getting more pussy and fucking... Yeah, uh, we were death row than people out in society. Well, like, people love a madman. Like, what? What do you think that attraction is? It's like people who are into goth, or people who are into um, role plays, or whatever. It's just a segment of society that's going to be weirdly at them. You remember Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker in California? Right? Like mm -hmm. this guy terrorized Los Angeles and then got caught when the whole neighborhood chased his bitch ass down the street and the cops had to save him. Women were in the courthouse and in the visiting center fighting over him. There's this weird phenomenon that takes place where mentally off women glorify and glamorize these men as if they're sexual. It's deep, dark shit. You know what I mean? But if you look at Netflix, like I, I, I do love the true crime stuff. I love the the mad shit. It's interesting when people go into prisons and speak to them. It's the biggest titles on Netflix is true crime. People love the dark, mad shit that people. I haven't watched one episode of one show. I can't watch any of it. Yeah, you've lived it though, right? For people who's never lived it, don't experience it. It's intriguing. Like, that's... do you see that? Like, why people are so intrigued by mad stuff? I honestly believe that when you get caught up watching it as entertainment, you're trading off a part of your humanity to feel for people. Like after a while, the screams won't even bother most people. I remember some of the adverts back in the day for crime and investigation. Um, they were doing the adverts for Christmas. It's a bloody mayhem Christmas on the crime and investigation investigation channel dine with us with guts galore i'm like what the fuck really like i'm not bashing you crime and investigation i want to sell you this brand new tv series that i wrote and i love you and thank you for letting me do uh advertisements for um, the, um i'm a murderer so i actually love them but it's strange how it's a glorification of a genre of television that people can't turn away from. What was the biggest TV series documentary style in the last few years? The Tiger King <laughs> about the attempted yeah. murder of, yeah, and then the possible murder of that woman's husband. She, he, he's alive. He ain't alive. I see not. 
I thought last year so he came out and he came back. After really? Three. Yeah. He's Wait back. A what? He's back. I left and that woman was a dirty murderer. No, and he checked us all. He's back. He, See what he's, I mean? He's still alive. Wow. Fucking years and years. Sort because of. they made it look like he was dead. Yeah. And she was a murderer. And the Tiger King was the nutcase. Yeah, and it and Joe, that was interesting yeah. that show though. But do you see what I mean? Yeah. Crime and crazy lives are like car wrecks. We can't stop looking. Mm -hmm. I don't care how fast you're going down the motorway, everyone slows down to see the wreck. Yeah, that's why the traffic is majority yeah. of traffic has people slowing down. Yeah, because they need to look. You know what I find fascinating about society in prison. The three things that will get you killed right away is if you speak about a man's family, why he's in that prison, or about his religion. If you attack a man in prison about one of those three things, he's going to kill you if that's the rule of the land, right? Out here in society, the first thing they attack you for is why you're here, your family, and what you believe. Isn't that sad? Switched around. Yeah, because when I grew up in Philly, you had to be really cool to stand next to the older boys and get their opinion. They guarded their opinions. You weren't allowed to know what they thought. They pressed, that was precious. You know what I mean? You had to be really cool to know someone's opinion. Now everyone splashes it. Everyone's a judge. Everyone has to have a perspective on it. That's why I thought in that movie, uh, Vengeance, that uh, B.J. Novak just wrote, it was a brilliant end that um, Ashton Kusher stated about our current society, where he admits that he helped a girl overdosing just be drug out into the... But it doesn't matter that he uh, admits it, because at the end of the day, someone's going to look at what he said and say, hold on. He's not guilty. She's guilty. And that will undo this whole thing. And it's true. Somewhere along the line, no matter what, someone's going to say something contrary to everyone else because everybody's got an opinion. How many different gangs were in the prison system in America? Ooh, the big ones are um, like the Pagan's Motorcycle Gang, the Aryan Nation junior black mafia other black gangs so the um latin kings are the biggest um spanish organization in america and they overall are the biggest organized gang in america so all of the spanish americans combined make up the latin kings so you have mexican puerto rican honduras it don't matter but they run the prison system and the prison system run is run. I mean, the streets are run by the prisons. Did you get offered to join a gang? No, I, back in the seventies, we had to have a gang for protection because everything was street corners and like they would come by in flatbed trucks and converted vans and jump out with baseball bats and attack us and stuff. Who did you join? 74th Street was the only gang I could join because that's where I lived. So basically, you hung out where you lived, right at the pizza parlor on my corner. What was your worst day in prison? <sighs> I walked past the cell and the curtain moved and there was a white kid sitting on his bed. You're not allowed to look in the cells, James. You can get really attacked that way. But I, I looked, and he had, like, something in his head. So I looked again, and he had a screwdriver sticking out of his head. So he, I walked in the cell. I was like, dude, hold on. I'm going to go get the guard, all right? And he looked at me. He said, am I going to die? And I said, no, man, I promise you. I'm going to go get the officer. And then when I turned around the ground, he slumped over, so... I fucking lied to that kid, told him he was going to be okay. That always bothered me. I never told anybody that because I felt so horrified that I was only 20, 21 years old. And I'm waiting to go to Huntington and I see this kid and somebody stabbed him in the head for like some packs of cigarettes. Uh, 
That was the worst day for me because it wasn't about me and proving my innocence or something. I just, I don't know, man. It really bothered me for a long time. How did you end up escaping, Nick? I was being transported for a new trial. And I was happy to go to court, but it was the coldest night of the year in February of 1985. And we stopped to use the restroom. And when I came out of the cubicle, the officer standing there holding the door for me had to take a piss so bad. He let me go back to the car by myself. So the dude standing at the car, smoking a cigarette, turned around and saw me coming at him, freaked out, grabbed his pistol, and fired a shot at me. No warning, just bam. So off we went, you know, like Tom Hardy said in the Peaky Blinders, whoop, here we go. So yeah, I, I start running and I did the crazy Philly thing. So I, like I, I ran a hundred yards, another hundred yards right, another hundred yards right. And I was right back behind the cop car that I just got out of. So while they were screaming at each other, getting on the radio, telling each other the stories they're going to tell and getting their shit together, I was about 30, 35 yards away from them, laying down on my belly, watching them, because they're not coming back to the cop car where I escaped, you get it? They're going that way. So I looked up and there was a flag for an municipal building, which was a police station, and I went and hide there. And I got frozen cold and I came out of there. And then, oh my God, the helicopter came. So the craziest thing was I was running at one point and I had the blades down on me. And as I was coming up to this big fence, I'm like, oh no, how am I getting over a 10 foot fence? But a snow plow had pushed the fence back so far that as I was getting right to it, I went right down a big hill and slid and the helicopter was pushing so much snow over me. He had to come back and circle. And I went down on this ravine and got on these railroad tracks and got out of there. Five and a half hours, he chased me with a helicopter, man. He had to refuel. The infrared wasn't working. I split my calves, my quads, my feet broke open. My face was all torn up from running through the trees without caring. I was just so exhausted. I walked for five miles and I found a 1965 green Mustang and I drove that to New York City. How long were you on the run for? 25 days. And then, yeah, it's crazy. Look, I meet this girl in Fort Lauderdale, good looking little young girl. I go back to her mom had a little real estate out office in one of those strip malls. We get busy in there, have some fun. She invites me to her house the next night to pick her up. When I come to the house, she meant come in for dinner. Dude, I'm in somebody's house. I don't know while I'm on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. And her mom is charmed by me and likes me. So much so that when they found me and found her phone number on my pocket, they called her and my mom got on the phone and said, well, you're going to have to excuse me, but he's still the nicest boy she ever brought home. <laughs> <laughs> Death row dating, right? <laughs> Did she know anything about you? No. Little girl, man. I just, I was standing, it was spring break. I'm 24 years old. I've just been in solitary confinement for three years. There's girls everywhere, James. You know what I mean? And check this out. The reason I didn't even look like myself, when I was in New York City, I had all these scratches and cuts all over me from running through the forest, getting away from that chopper, right? I mean, I was scratched bad. I knew I looked weird and shit. So I was walking through the uh, the uh village and there was two gay gentlemen in his hair salon and in the flash it just came to me i burst in the door and pretended that my boyfriend had beat the shit out of me look what he's done to me they took me and sat me in a chair and permed my hair dyed it black and then they put makeup all over my face and covered everything up called a friend of theirs who was an optometrist got me new glasses made i was like i came out of there two hours later i'm like dude i had a perm I got, got the prison picture from the 
I look like the dude from um uh um uh, what's the actor um oh uh, he's the he from Limitless. Uh remember, remember the movie American Hustle? Yeah. That's my character yeah. with that hair. Mm -hmm. Like, oh my god. Limitless was a great film. Great film. Brad, Bradley Cooper. Bradley Cooper. Yeah, I love Brad. Uh listen, man. He's an Eagles fan. He's sober. I know. Yeah. He's sober as well. I know. I'd love to meet him. I really would. It was a big honor. Get him to play your part? No, get him to, to help me with I have a brand new TV series about the American judicial system that's gonna be the next breaking bad. It's fictionalized storytelling 101 about the judicial system in a way it's never been told before. And it's going to be a hit. I believe that. I know. I, I really have so much belief in myself. I wrote a children's book called Animal Kind. I wrote a stage play called Big House Voices, a musical. Beautiful. I love using whatever time I get knocked down, that's when I turn to my art. Therapy? Yeah, because I, I don't want to die both ways. I don't want to die mentally, even if I'm dying emotionally. See, when you were on the run, how did you get caught? I turned myself in, man. Why? Because I couldn't outrun everybody and I was going to get my brother killed or something. Like, I had to go back. The worst time of it was I was sitting on the 101 um, in Florida, Lauderdale, Florida, looking out at the ocean. And I was so exhausted and so worried that as soon as they saw me, they were just going to shoot me, you know? There was an army navy shop and i was going to go get the big yellow raft fill it up with all my favorite foods then i was going to paddle out in the ocean as far as i could go then i was going to have one amazing sunset dinner in that raft out in the shipping lane then i was going to cut my arms and make the sharks come around and then i was going to stab the the uh the raft and then shoot myself in the head and never be seen again. I couldn't go, I couldn't keep putting my family through this. If I was dead, then they never would be bothered. And like, I don't, that's what I was thinking then. Nah. So eventually at one point I got caught in a stolen car and I had bail money and I was going to bail out and everything was like set to go. I walked over and picked up the phone and called my dad. And I said, dad, you got to call the FBI right now and tell them to come get me. And he did. Death row, life sentence, you're free. You phoned up and held yourself in. How many years into your sentence? So I got another 35 years for that. <laughs> Try to do a good turn. You think they'd have reduced your sentence, I the bastards? Yeah, I ended up with <laughs> 105 years of sentences plus the death penalty. And you know what I did? I went back to Pennsylvania, enrolled in university. I fucking, I said, I'm going to die here, so I'm going to grow up. And I started reading thousands of books. I stopped counting at 9,400 books. Is that a book a day? Three. No, just. Yes, yeah, like I, I was able to knock out like a 225 page fiction novel in two and a half hours. And then I would go and take a break and do something else and then pick out a different book and then read half of that one and then read half of another one and then finish off the evening by switching back and fish those two off. So sometimes a week would go by and I'd knock off 14 to 16 books and be so proud of myself. See all that stuff, the escapes that all over the news and papers? Yeah. So see when you go back to prison, like Buffalo Bill must have been thinking, you silly cunt. <laughs> what no. was a prisoner saying? That yeah. you held yourself in? It's, it's weird how you're just a nobody in there. I don't give a shit what you did outside. Every man's got his misery and he don't yeah. care about you. And the crazy thing is when you're innocent, you can't even say that shit. I'm going to tell a death row prisoner who's butchered a family and held them for hostage for fast food that I'm innocent. He's going to laugh in my face or he's going to victimize me. You get it? Mm. So I had to be harder than him. Yeah. I don't look. I don't care what the next man was or did. I was going to come home to my mom. 
She made me promise to come home to her. So I wasn't trying to be the hardest man. I was trying to get out. You know what I mean? What was that appeal system like in America, especially in the 70s and 80s? Yeah. Were you fighting for appeal straight away or was it something you I just it. accepted? I've ruined my appeals with the escape. And so if it wasn't for DNA, I was dead. My appeals were done. I had no legal chance to overcome what they did to me. In fact, here's a true story. No person in America actually has any Miranda rights because of a case called Salinas versus Texas in 2014, where they said the Supreme Court of America said, quoting Nicholas Yaris versus the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, that it's called the utterance law. If a police walks up to you and says hello and you answer him, you've waived your rights to silence. That's what they're saying now. So they used my case in which I am innocent to strip every American of their Miranda rights under a case called Selena, Salinas versus Texas. So see, when you started going, when you have no appeal then, like how did things start to progress for you to then try and get out how many years later so i kept fighting for dna testing and dna testing and dna testing i just i did a lot of my own work i was blessed with a lawyer named peter goldberger who is a professor of law from haverford university i had the federal defenders come on at one point I was married to a woman while I was in prison at one point for nine years, and she did a lot of help on the outside trying to help me. It was a lot, James. I didn't think I was going to make it a lot of times, so I just kept trying to find happiness. And how did you find your happiness while your life in prison waiting to die? I was a donut magnet. I got donuts from the guys I did legal work for and got them off death row. And then I, I got into this thing about being really grateful, be alive. I circumnavigated the planet while I was on death row by sending my hair to different people all over. If I had a pen pal in Peru or I had a pen pal in Australia or New Zealand, I would send them a little bit of my hair from their barber and they would put my hair in the ocean because I knew about DNA testing. I was so clever that while I was on death row, I circumnavigated the planet. Did you give people your hair as well, just in case you ever passed away, that they could still do the test after your death? No. This was just one thing. I wanted to set me free in some way, as far as I could send me. Was there any celebrities in prison when you were there? Yeah, there's. I got a man out named Walter Ograd in 2020 that I met. He was convicted of taking a little child and killing him her and putting it in a tv box on the street and i knew he was innocent and i got him out why is there so many wrongly convictions in america it's the fourth biggest industry in america too much money no too many people all right so look if the justice system says we get it wrong only three percent of the time we get it right 97 percent of the time well three percent of two million people is sixty thousand people how much does the state have we get paid each year for each inmate? 50,000, 100,000? They get about, now, probably about $70,000 for each inmate that they're housing for their budget. Millions upon millions of dollars. But they've turned it into an industry. They have inmates working for 17 cents an hour making shirts, T-shirts, socks, and selling them online under the Big House Products brand. Crazy. Slavery. Yeah, there, so it's legal slavery. Did you see the, f the flaws in the prison system when you started educating yourself and started understanding how it functions? Sure. And then I realized that none of it had anything to do with me and that I was on a journey to either, like you said, turn towards the hero or the zero. Who threw you under the bus? Did you have? Or were you just a number to get into prison? Because what happens here as well... I've interviewed so many men who's done 20 years, 25 years in prison in Scotland and their cases got overturned. But what happens is the police needed to get a conviction. Right. So now you just, back then you needed two witnesses. 
to it's witnesses shame. they could have gave money to to say I yeah, know here to him Philly was that. like that Absolutely. yeah and Look, it's Joe Steele and TC Campbell TC dead James it was so bad that after I started asking for DNA testing they started destroyed the evidence like this wasn't no heat of the trial shit mm -hmm. they deliberately started to destroy the DNA evidence and was cheating that woman out of justice that's what was infuriating me Want to know the first thing I did when I got out of prison and got my health back? Message the family? No. I got a bullhorn and went right to the courthouse. There's a movie in America on the Showtime network called After Innocence. Mm -hmm. Phil Donahue, Barry Sheck, Peter Neufeld, all these big people are in it. Yeah? I went to the courthouse every Monday and protested how they weren't trying to catch the real murderer. This case is still not solved. So you understand what it means to me that I, the man sentenced to death for a woman I never met, had to go back and fight them to get the DNA put into the system so that they can catch the killer. I shouldn't have had to do that. But I felt so bad for that woman. Do you know, every Christmas I pray for her. I want her to get justice. I want them to find the real killer. Not for me. For her. How about that? I shouldn't have to be the one calling the prosecutor's office. I shouldn't have to be the one telling them how they should use that family DNA to catch that guy just like they caught the Golden State Killer recently, right? They should be doing that. That poor woman got butchered, man, and I paid for that. So I want that killer put in prison or his identity known. Did you ever know that woman? I never met her in my life, man. She was working out in the mall in the state of Delaware where she got abducted 26 miles away from me. And at that same day, I paid a phone bill for my mother at 3.05 p.m., an hour before the attack. There was no possible way I could have been out there and then been back at a store and at home at dinner. Like at 4.45, they said it was possible for me to have gone and do it. I'm like, no. So the crazy thing is my mom knew she was feeding me at the time that I was supposed to have done the murder, and that's what really broke her heart. How can someone tell me that while I was feeding my son, he was doing this horrible thing, she'd say. That's why she stood by me the whole ride. Do you think that's what's kept you alive then, your mum? Yeah, she made me make a promise when I first got out of prison to be a, a polite person, a respectful person, and to say yes ma'am and yes no, to show respect for what was done to her family, not just me. Yeah, it's hard because how can you show respect to people who's torturing you every day to be hearing psychopaths? Oh, because you have to, yeah, you have to feel sorry for them. Was that what you did? Yeah, because if you think about it, you got to be really fucked up to go into a prison and play with people and hurt them. And so I developed this beautiful ability to have mercy and pity on them. What else can you do, man? Was there any good prison officers? Yeah, man. One saved my ass after the riot, and one gave me my whole education by letting me go in a cell where a man had killed himself to start my get those books that I told you about. There are good officers. One of my best friends works right now in San Quentin Prison in America. And he and I have been friends for the last five years, man, at least six, seven years. His name's Sean. He's a brilliant friend of mine, but he's a prison guard in San Quentin right now, man. Yes, yeah, mad bastards on San Quentin. Yeah, so he's got to deal with that. But who else could I build up a better relationship with someone who has to go to prison every day? So see when you think you're never getting out and you start educating yourself, when did you find out about DNA? 1988. What were you thinking then? Oh, I got the keys. I'm going straight away. Yeah, and then all of a sudden, six months became a year, two years, three years, five years, nine years. And then Jackie walked in and left me when they thought they had destroyed all the evidence. So it went on for another six years after my wife left me. And then finally, 
In 2003, they got DNA results from the killer's gloves that were hidden at my trial. They got DNA later on that year from the underwear the victim was wearing, and none of it matched me. They had two different DNA profiles of from two different men, and none of it matched me. And they then decided, oh, fuck, how are we going to let him out? And it took them another seven months to let me out. So see when all the evidence comes put together and you realise as you weren't there, it wasn't your DNA. What you thinking that you've been set up f to lose 20 odd years of your life? No, you don't do that to yourself. This is what you do. You realise you're getting a huge blessing, but it's going to be a traumatic event. You better man up because everything that you studied, everything that you learned inside you're going to need it on the outside. Dude, I did 8,057 days in solitary confinement, man. Not in prison, in a tiny cell, 23 hours a day. Then they open the door and you can have anything? Imagine that. That's a mental challenge, man. Did they do any background checks mentally? Did they do any psychological checks on the mind? Doctors. Oh, you mean psychologists? Like, no, they don't care about you, man. You're you're getting out, even though you've lived next to fucking Buffalo Bill and you've spent over twenty years in prison. Man, I, I made deals with Buffalo Bill. I got commissary off of him, and I I sold him chocolate bars and shit. You know what I mean? Patted him on his crazy head, that kind of shit. I played patty cakes with a cannibal once. What's that? I played patty cakes with a cannibal. In the county jail, they had this cannibal called this, the Trailblazer. And um, he was so out of his mind on drugs in the county jail, I walked over and he was like this at the table because he was all doped up. So I picked his hand up and it stayed up. I was like, that's cool. So I picked both hands up and then I went, patty cake, patty cake, baker's cake. And the guard got on the PA system. He said, Yaris, stop playing with the cannibal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Is that how you get by as well, laughter? Oh, my God, yes. Like, this is the funniest place in the world, man. Death Row humor is the funniest shit ever. I'd be a brilliant comedian. I already know it. Because I know how the true value of making people laugh in the worst situation. See, when you get married, I would get married in prison. Yeah, I got married to a woman named Jackie while I was in handcuffs in 1988 when I first found out about DNA testing, thinking, bam, 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 I'm getting out. So, yeah, and then... How did you deal with that, like, kind of loss? Yeah, when someone kicks the chair out from under you and you're on death row, that's man-up time. I honestly, this is the way I did it. I loved her assiduously. I wrote her a 10-page letter almost every day for 10 years. And she left. I am so grateful for what she gave me during those nine years. I can never hold an ill feeling for her for leaving me. But I'm also able to not feel anything because she left. See, when she left, was that because you weren't getting out? Yeah, they, they destroyed all the evidence, she thought, and she, her mom just passed away, and she met a guy named Bob, and she wanted to go on and have a life. Can you understand that, though? Yeah, she, I can. It's painful, but if she's not getting out, then... Yeah, I was beautifully sweet to her as best that I could so that she could go be happy. I wrote her a very nice letter, and I told her, at least one of us can now be free. Go be happy. But I had to stop any feeling about this after that. You understand? Because mm -hmm. it would have drove me nuts. So see when you go through the process and then you get a green light that there's a chance you're getting out, like what's the feeling? Did you feel any emotion? Yeah, of course, man. I was so regretful that I lost so much chances in my life to be a nice person. And I grieved for my little brother dying in my parents' basement. And I wondered if I could actually handle freedom. I'm a really strange character in that 
I've been trained to kill people. I taught myself how to heal people. And I've lived with people trying to murder me and do horrible things to me. And somewhere in the balance, the only answer I can keep coming back to is kindness and love. It's the only thing kept me sane. Why do you think you've had so much torture and torment in your life? Do you ever feel as if you're cursed? No, I think that if you think about it in this terms, I was given a beautiful message to help people heal, but the only way that people would ever accept this message is if they saw me humbly suffer the worst things both in prison, from childhood, and then after prison. So that now, people will believe me when I tell them, you can handle anything if you just listen to what I'm telling you about neuroplasticity. So think about this. I've paid all my dues and I don't question God. If I had to go through being raped, stabbed, sentenced to death, a drug addict, humiliate myself and do all kinds of horrible things that have been done to me over and over. I've had all of my relationships fall apart and yet here I am, stone in love with Laura Thompson. I've already begun healing with her again. And we just came back from the devastation of losing everything to COVID. I'm about to be the happiest man in the world. All I had to do was just crawl through a really long river of shit like my man in the Shawshank Redemption did. See, when you found out you were getting out, like, what was going through your mind? All that years of suffering, pain, misery, then educating yourself to try and find love and peace and forgiveness. Like, you, your head must have been fucking all over the place. Because I know men who've been in prison after 20 odd years, they've got a release date, killed themselves. Yeah, no, I was on a mission. I decided that my, I started off in the basement of my parents' house when my brother died of a drug overdose. And I decided that all of this was going to have meaning. So within... Only six months of my release, I had already organized a five country speaking opportunity to defend myself with eloquence and my education for what they did to me. How were you treated when you got out? Like everybody thought I was crazy because I was on death row. Isn't that something? I think everybody's got an element of crazy in them. It doesn't matter. All I know is they were measuring me a against the backdrop of what would be them if they went to prison for 23 years for something they didn't do. They kept expecting me to be diminished, lesser of a man, lesser of a person. I'm like, no, I grew. I was so beautifully alive. I would stand in my cell and eloquently quote Walt Whitman or all of these beautiful works of poetry and art, I was next level happy because I wasn't some street kid from Philly. Meanwhile, they thought that I was nuts in the head, but I had something they couldn't understand. I had self-respect and self-love. The old fashioned saying knowledge is power. How, how true is that then? It is absolutely true because at the age of 20, at the time of my trial, I didn't understand a lot of the words used against me. At the age of 29, I walked into a court and educated the court about DNA testing. I was the smartest man in the room. What was it like your first day out? It started out odd. Everybody wanted to hug me. I hadn't hugged other people. At 10 o'clock, I had to watch the news and freak out at looking at my image because I didn't know who that old guy was on TV. I didn't have a mirror in my cell for so long. I didn't know what I looked like. Why? Because you don't see pictures of yourself. You don't know what you look like. You don't see yourself in a mirror. Are you allowed a mirror? No, it was a piece of metal. It was scratched up. It was on the wall, bolted to the wall, and it had been scratched up. Mm. So you don't get to see yourself. You don't know who you are. You don't know. You don't see videos of yourself. You don't see photographs of yourself. And then my sister Anne-Marie got all drunk and started a big fight at the end of the night. 
because I wanted to wear a baseball cap to cover up my bald head. And she said I looked like a dick and all this stuff. And my dad, for the first time ever, told her to shut her mouth. I was his son, and you don't know what they did to this boy. Leave him alone. So I got all upset because I can't be around yelling because in prison, if someone yells, someone's going to die. So I freaked out. I went downstairs, and I ended up out back pissing against the wall with my head pressed against the stones of the wall and I felt so ashamed and horrified that my whole family was dysfunctional and alcoholic that I had no hope living there. See when you make changes in life and that's the heartbreaking thing you start seeing the dysfunction everywhere around you when you when I started becoming clean and sober I, I realized how fucked fucked up I was that I accepted that life for so long I'm talking about mad men nothing that no but extent, it's true but taking drugs is self-harming yeah but yeah we used to sit in the house for three four days talking pure shit and we thought it was cool I know we thought it was cool who could stay up the longest we not thought only it was that cool but who could snort the most gear that and how Jesus. much lying were you doing? Like, all of it was bullshit. Yeah, it was all There's fake. The, I know. Oh, my God. So that's what I was living around, right? It's heartbreaking to see that. Yeah, like, my sister Sissy lured me to a bar a couple of nights after I got out. Like, two weeks after I got out. Come down here. All these guys want to meet you, Nick. Come on down. So I thought I'd throw her a grace. Turns out the dude sitting on the bar stool next to her had some really good coke, and she wanted $20 off me. So my, my fucking sister lured me into a bar knowing I'm a former alcoholic who just got off a death row to get some money off me so she could buy some cocaine off this guy. It was fucked up. I had to get out of there, man. That's when I knew I had to get away from Philadelphia. Yeah, that's the sad thing. That It's not that people... They don't, like your sister probably, it's just the life she lives. She thought it's normal. She doesn't realise the extent no, of you getting sucked back in that That's how hole. dysfunctional it is. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you end up obsessing with everything you're doing now in your life? Because you've been married three, four times now. Yeah, so I'm married to Laura Thompson Yaris. Um, I just came back to the United Kingdom. I just started a brand new speaking tour. I have no housing. I have no bank account, as you know. I have um, been surfer, uh, surfing a sofa up in Lincolnshire, and I'm absolutely happy, man. It's brilliant. James, like, I love being the comeback kid. I got the opportunity, think about this, to have a whirlwind, reunited romance with my wife. I get a chance to come back to England, the place that I love and started off as, and my hope is to move to Ireland this summer and have a one-man stage play in Dublin. And that's where I want to end up in Ireland, where my grandmother came from. Back to your roots. Yeah, back to my roots. Hattie Shaw. That was her name, Harriet Hattie Shaw. How's your trust issues? You see me, man. I believe in everyone. They, I told you, I don't let nobody talk shit about you and I stand up for friends. I believe in that. I believe in trust because someone steals your trust, they're stealing a part of you. And if anybody steals your kindness, they're taking away from you who you are. Yeah, I heard Mike Tyson. Somebody was talking about Mike Tyson. Somebody says if anybody if anybody gave him shit, this kid was saying he just c c cuts them off, disconnects them. Never speak to him. Tyson says, well, they've won. And he goes, how so? He says, because they've changed you. They've changed you. Yeah. The guy done wow. Uh, yeah. people cutting them off and being ruthless I used to do that and he says well they've won they've changed you yeah so it's weird how we have to fight to cling to who we are and that's a brilliant part to bring this to a conclusion because if you think about it James you're witnessing in real time how I've come back from all these things and I'm so hopeful most people would be bitter having lost your your family living in the woods for the last three years having no money, having no place to call your own. A lot of people would freak out from all of those realities, right? Not me. I'm happy as hell. I'm here to see you. I'm here to do this work because I know someone needs to hear this. Do you know what I mean? There's a bigger purpose for me and you to sit down. Somebody before they heard this thought they had it shit. 
and they ain't getting any messaging from anyone around them that they care about because, like you said, it's dysfunction, right? But me and you talking today gave them this beautiful chance to believe in themselves and come back, man. Yeah, people can watch this and are, listen to this story and think, shit, what have I got to moan about? Everybody's got different levels of trauma and pain. Like we spoke earlier, you either become the hero or you become the villain. Yeah. But because you, it's your choice and that's the, the mad thing about life. Everything comes down to choices, but nothing changes and like unless you do but let's talk about the neuroplans neuroplan plan, plasticity plasticity yeah so it's Plastic. neuroplastic yeah yeah is that because I, i'm a big fan of joe dispenser and he talks about neurons in the brain which fire together wired together so when you spoke about earlier writing the word down 10 times finding writing the meaning down 10 times neurons in the brain which fire together wire together create that memory and then creates different patterns for the subconscious mind right. so the brain does rewire yeah i never thought i would go over gambling i thought about gambling 24 7 but the consistency of it staying on the path day at a time day at a time every time it was it was hard and then it just fizzles and then it, like you see you become a new person i ain't that person of the past a lot of people still see, see me as that person who don't know me now of the changes and that's okay that's on them because they've not changed but Let's talk about that because a lot of people are stuck in a rut. So how did how do you go about it? Right. This is why I wrote the book, The Kindness Approach. Basically, you have a built-in reward system in your brain. The only way to trigger it is to be like in a gymnasium. Working with weights, you can build your body up, right? Being in society and using charm and charisma to be polite to people, you erase all your own ptsd think about it while you're out being nice to sally and johnny and having that laugh and that talk and going at it like that especially in a business atmosphere you should use a business atmosphere i don't even care if it's mcdonald's to get people to laugh because if you can get people to laugh you're sharing that laughter and joy with your brain and you're erasing your own ptsd it's that simple when I found out my mother's promise to her to be polite was the onset of beginning to have neuroplasticity healing, it was like God wrote it in my sleeve. And I love it that 19 years on, I can really teach people how to get a new perspective and change all the things killing them. Excuse me. <coughs> I believe in this so much. My wife and I are healing because we're actually beginning with respect. We're beginning with politeness to work towards all of the things we once had. And it's hard after you've been through trauma and separation and having to have her move back here and then me come back. And yet, Every chance we're going to get, we have to go back and use the very things that we used begun to, to begin with, which was politeness and respect. You can't have love without respect. If you don't respect the person, you can't love them because it'll break down. So that's where I'm at. I'm at this really cold part where I'm going around the world teaching people about neuroplasticity healing and in real time, proving it works because I'm using it to save my own self and I'm dealing with CTE brain injury, man. Because with all the stuff you've been through, all the trauma, all the pain, what was, what was your darkest moment, Nick? Losing my daughter to SIDS, finding her dead. Oh. That was horrific, man. She was only six months old. Her name was Jamie Lee. She was a beautiful little girl. And she died in her crib. And then the sinister fucking internet started picking at me and tormenting me because I ain't allowed to have a normal grieving situation like that. There's always got to be that dark element out there that makes it like I did something, you know? So that was some real dark shit that I had to live with while I saw in real time how I could be an instrument of healing for Laura and the girls. So I took the darkest part of my life, the darkest moment ever, and I decided to try and give it beauty. That's all I can do, man. 
Yeah, fair play, mate. Like, I thought I was a strong cat because I'd stopped addictions and stuff, but from the, the cards you've been dealt from a young age to being abused, to being wrongly convicted, to be losing a child, like, and you're still here, mate, pushing the kindness and love, mate. It shows you your kind of character. Like, why do you think you were given those cards? So I could teach people a message. All of the greatest messages we've ever gotten in life, that person had to suffer for them. And I know it's a shitty feeling, but I literally had to go through the worst things possible so that people could embrace my message. Otherwise, no one would listen. They made a documentary about your life as well? Yeah, I made a documentary with a English director named David Sinkton who reneged on the deal. And it came out as The Fear of 13. And it was on BBC Four here in England and Scotland and Wales. And then... It got released on Netflix for a long time, but now it's like mainly you can only find it on YouTube or somewhere else. But it's funny how I have a brand new series out called The uh, Life After Death, in which I drove across America, visited my father one last time, went to my mother's grave, got filmed in the prison I got stabbed in, and then came back to Los Angeles, did a big podcast, and then went back and gave all my stuff away. I gave my RV to a family that has a handicapped daughter. I gave my car to a friend of mine who was smoking meth while he was driving me to the airport. So literally, I just rolled over and went to sleep. And my boy Chris was just puffing meth all the way up to I-5 to take me up to Seattle. <laughs> it's crazy. How was Joe Rogan? Yeah, so it was... Uh, a weird experience because I, I, uh, all the things around it that went sideways leading up to me. But I got some brilliant messages out of the podcast that really impacted my life. And I met a huge amount of cool people. So it was one of those experiences where that was the first big podcast I ever did. And that was the week after Elon Musk smoked that joint on the podcast. Yeah, you sat in the chair with some mad people, but everything you've been through to still be here to tell the tale and still try to see the positives in life. Like I said, it takes a beautiful soul to do all that. Like, it's mad to think that like, people will be gone. People will think that story's unbelievable. They don't even know the half of it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> what was it? In the last month and a half, I broke my fingers three times, broke it that night I was talking to you, fell over and it went sideways again. I've had my passport confiscated at the airport. I have no documentation. Um, like I said, all these things would drive most people crazy, but I believe so much that I'm meant to be doing what I'm doing. I met a man today only because of you. Only because I was coming to meet you today did I meet a man who just came back from Australia who went there at the age of 19, and the only reason I met him was because of jelly beans. His father has a woman work for him that is a representative for the Jelly Belly Company. His son, who I'm talking about, also is a diabetic and at one point had his life saved by having jelly beans nearby. So I met a man today that I'm going to help make a documentary about my friend with cancer whose dream is to come to uh, uh, Scotland because you brought me here today. Yeah. So if that's all true... How can I not believe? How can I be bitter? Why waste it? Right? So, no, I'm going to grab onto this feeling that I'm living one of the best stories ever. Why be bitter about it? Do you believe in synchronicity? I do. I believe in God's grace is currency. Currency creates synchronicity. Synchronicity makes things happen. Did you ever hear of the Marley moment? Hmm. Bob Marley jumped on stage after getting two opposing sides to shake hands during the worst things. And then he said, yeah, man. And he jumped in the air and clapped. And just as he clapped, the bolt of lightning hit. Hmm. That's the Marley moment. That's the synchronicity of beauty of humanity that can't be explained. Just like they believe that the fifth element is that energy has memory. Because you're so educated, I think it's important to ask these sort of questions because I only ask a few people these questions, but why do you think we're here, Nick, as a human being? What do you think your purpose is? I, I ask myself that 
Nearly every night, like, what the fuck are we here for? Why are we here? Who created us? All right, so if everything was created, then the creator needs joy. We're the only creatures capable of sustaining our garden and bringing all this joy to life. I know we get it wrong. I know we as a human race have a long way to go before we're deserving of this blessing. But if the creator created all of this, whatever that creator is, must understand joy because they created joy. So I think we're here like the gardeners of this beautiful earth. And we better recognize that because we're going to push her to so hard, she's going to shake us off like a bad memory. Yeah. Plans for the future, Nick? Yeah, I want to go first. Big event at Cambridge speaking. I want to go and I want to find a place to settle down and heal. And I, I want to keep trying to, to get all these lads in the United Kingdom, whether you're Welsh, Irish, Scottish, or English, I want to give that effort back to these lads to not let them be fucked up on drugs, kill themselves, or abuse others. And if I can do that, then I feel like I've accomplished something from what they did to me. Yeah? Why do you think so many men are struggling just now? because of what COVID did to us, because of what happened to Brexit, because of the queen dying, because of so many factors in society. Right now, people at university are killing themselves, which is stupid. Because it shouldn't be that way. People are killing themselves in the United Kingdom when there shouldn't be this. Life is so precious, people are forgetting that person after person after person fought through plagues and wars and everything to give us our today chance today. My grandparents and my great grandparents and my and those before them fought so hard to give me this gift. How could I waste that? Yes, I fall and pray to sorrow and I almost did it and I'm a, and I'm so apologetic about it. But James, if you think about it, man, we're so lucky that somebody fought their hardest to give us this chance, man. Yeah, that's the thing. I work with a suicide center in Scotland called Chrissy's House, and we've had people come in with the rope, burns around their neck, and the first thing that happens when they hang, them, hang themselves, I don't want to die. That's the first thought yeah. that comes into their mind. They don't realize how it goes until it goes. How beautiful it can be, and it's it's sad society we we're in where people are taking their lives every few seconds, like, but... Just hopefully things can change and men like yourself speaking out and telling your amazing story. I, listen, it's dark as well, but it's also turned into a, a positive, which is an amazing thing, especially the life you've led. If for anybody that's maybe watching just now or, or listening and somebody's wanting to help you, maybe offer you a job or, or whatever it is, how can people get in contact with you? It's usually the best thing to do for now is Instagram. You know, I have, you have my contact details as well. Um, I set up a GoFundMe so that I could try and get housing set up because it's I'm trying to reunite with my wife and children, but I have to start over. So what? Um, the cool thing is I really believe that today we'll get through to someone. I, if there's anybody that's watching this podcast and you're struggling to feel like you have anything worthwhile to live for, don't do that. Come back and be strong because if you want, you can actually be so strong you can keep the next person from killing themselves. So instead of worrying about you being alive, you could worry about making sure the next man's stronger and take that burden out of your heart. When you do that, you build me up and you build yourself up. So please, man, talk to someone. This is the worst thing. People who invariably hurt themselves, stop talking. Don't stop talking. Please, I beg you. Where can people buy your books, Nick? So these are on Amazon. These, uh, both of these books are now available on Amazon. I don't have copies of Seven Days to Live right now, but I'm sure I'll get that done. And 
I want to go forward and and really try and publish some new material soon too. That would be really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to do fiction writing. I have all these great stories from my life. Like I wrote a book uh, called "That's Enough for Me," which is about a robbery that took place at the Philadelphia airport for three million dollars. All true story, and many members involved were members of my family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, listen, for coming on today, it's an unbelievable story. For what you've came through to what you're achieving now, man, like, I take my hat off to you. It's very inspirational. For anybody that's watching, Nick, that's stuck in that struggle, you know, you've been there, that dark place where you never thought you were getting out, you never thought there was a chance. What advice would you give for those people who are in a dark place at the moment? If you really don't want to suffer, try and reach out to someone and try and help someone else. If you can throw yourself into trying to help someone else, you'll start feeling empty. And if there's no one else to help, try your best to reach out and talk to somebody, anybody, even if it's on the internet, because on your own, you're not feeding your brain any healthy good. You have to come out of your shell and try to talk to someone. Please reach out. That's all I can say. Nick, would you like to finish up on anything else? No, I've, I really appreciate this, James, and I'm looking forward to seeing this podcast. And for all my lovely bros in the United Kingdom, thank you for making me feel so strong. I love being back here, man. Nick, God bless you, and I look forward to seeing what you do for the future. Thank you, Take sir. Care.